Kia ora whanau and welcome back to What's in the News podcast. I'm your host Barnaby Watts. Uh, today I'm honoured to be speaking with one of Aotearoa's most dedicated activists, John Minto. Uh, John served as chairman for the Holt All Racist Tours organisation and was a crucial figurehead in the protests against the 1981 Springbok Tour. His life has been dedicated to various struggles for liberation and recently has been a prominent voice in the movement for justice for Palestinians. The ongoing human rights abuses that Palestinians face at the hands of the Israeli government will be the focus of our discussion today, as I certainly see it as an urgent situation which demands the attention of freedom fighters worldwide. Thank you for joining me, John. Um, now, the situation on the ground in Israel and Palestine is constantly developing. Um, and in fact, only a few days ago, a 15-year-old Palestinian boy, Ali Abu Aliyah, was shot and killed by the Israeli military. He was the fifth child to be killed with live ammunition this year alone. Um, so currently, what do you see as the most pressing issues faced by Palestinians? The main problems facing uh, Palestinians are the occupation, the Israeli occupation of, of Palestine, the refusal of Israel to um, allow refugees to return to their land and, and homes in, in what Israel claims as its own. And, um, and I think the... Um, the other perhaps biggest problem is the is the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, turning a blind eye and sort of pretending it's not happening. And New Zealand's in that category. New Zealand does, we vote all the right way at the United Nations once a year in, in November when these uh, resolutions on Palestine come up. New Zealand's got a good voting record, but we've got a very poor record at following through. So what we're, what we're not doing is putting into policy practice what we say we believe in, in terms of, um, you know, human rights for Palestinians. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and, and we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, you know, what kind of accountability our government might have uh, in terms of its ties to the US in particular. Um, but I want to touch on, um, of course, you're at the for forefront of uh, our anti-apartheid protests in the 1980s. Um, and Israel is often described as an apartheid state, which, you know, is a sentiment I'm, I'm sure me and you both agree with. Um, but what, what similarities and what differences uh, do you see between apartheid South Africa in the 20th century and present day Israel? Well, you know, the, the world expert on apartheid is um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa. Um, he was, uh, he lived, lived the reality um, under apartheid and he visited the West Bank, uh, visited Palestine. And he said what we faced in South Africa was not as bad as what Palestinians are facing in Palestine. And he said, in terms of Israeli policies, he said, name it apartheid and boycott. So if you, so he was very clear about that. And, and then if you look at it um, very specifically, specific similarities, if you like, um, within Israel itself, you have 20% of the population sorry, 20% of the citizens of Israel are Palestinian Israelis. But that 20% of the population suffer under discriminatory laws. So there are 65 discriminatory laws, which are all very clearly set out in the Adala website. Adala is an Arabic word for, for justice. Um, and so Palestinians who do have Israeli citizenship which are a very small, a small minority of Palestinians, they suffer under these apartheid laws, very similar to the laws that were in place in South Africa. They do have the right to vote and they have, um, uh, they have their own political representation in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the Neset, which is the, um, the Israeli parliament. But the problem is they are a minority and the, um, you know, two years ago, Israel passed a law, the Israeli parliament passed a law, the nation state law, which says that only Jews can have self-determination within Israel. No other group can. In other words, Palestinian Israelis in the land of their birth are specifically denied the right to self-determination. Now, that is racist. It is apartheid. It is the same sort of structure which South Africa um, set up. And... Um, Netanyahu and other um, the right wing leadership of Israel and all of the major major politicians uh, from these right wing parties, um, like the whole political discourse in Israel over the last ten years, particularly since Netanyahu has been prime minister, has shifted very much to the right, and the 
they are openly, blatantly racist in their commentary about Palestinians. You know, um, Netanyahu says, the only way to treat Palestinians is to beat them up, not once, but repeatedly beat them up <laughs> until it hurts, until it's unbearable. And uh, when your prime minister says that, then those attitudes filter all the way down to the, to the Israeli soldiers on the streets who end up shooting Palestinian children, as the, in the case you mentioned, you know, just in the last few days. The most appalling, egregious brutality and yet the world turns the other way. Um, we we do have to hold Israel to account. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. And in terms of turning the other way and, and how the conversation has just been so muddied by, as you say, all sorts of ideological forces, right-wing forces, um, and an issue I find um, with the discourse around the struggle for, for Palestinian liberation, uh, which infuriates me, is the conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. You know, now Jeremy Corbyn, of course, faced relentless accusations of anti-Semitism whilst he led the Labour Party in the UK, uh, which quite clearly stemmed from his open leftism and his criticism of Israel. Um, can you explain why, you know, that conflation is so flawed and why these allegations of, of anti-Semitism have been weaponized in, in such a way? Well, it's a, it's a desperate tactic on the part of the pro-Israeli lobby. So we've got, um, and it was explained very clearly and very plainly by a former Minister of Education, Shalomit Aloni, who was interviewed on Democracy Now! This is going back 20 years. And she just said straight out, she said, it's a trick we use. She said, when we're in Europe, we talk about the Holocaust. When we're in, in the United States, we talk about anti-Semitism. And she said, we use that as a defense for everything we do to the Palestinians. So this is just a continuation of a long-term strategy. They want to, um, to protect Israel from criticism. And the best way to do that is to attack anyone who criticizes Israel as being anti-Semitic. So they've been on this, um, they've been doing it for, for decades. And uh, if I, I'd like to just for a moment turn it around the other way and say that if you're an activist um, supporting Palestinian rights and you are not being subject to false smears of anti-Semitism, then you're not doing your job. I mean, I get false smears of anti-Semitism all the time. And, and that is a way that I know I'm doing my job because I'm getting, helping to get the message out there. Um, so... So it's a tactic that, that's been used, um, but I just want to um, just want to um, go back to a, a more important fundamental point before I mention Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. Just the, the reason that that uh, Israel is gets away with all of this is not so much the strength of the Israeli lobby. It's not so much the, the fact that they can um, deflect criticism of Israel by claiming that people who criticize Israel are anti-Semitic. It's because the, the US, the world's biggest imperial power, it's because they need, want and need a beachhead in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. So since 1967 in particular, the US has defended Israel at every turn. And they, they do that not because they are, they are um, uh, supportive, of, supportive of Jews. I mean, the, the Republican Party in the US is full of vile, filthy, right-wing anti-Semites, right from, right from Donald Trump all the way through. Donald Trump is always promoting these, um, these anti-Semitic tropes, which the pro-Israeli lobby refuse to criticize. But they'll criticize, uh, um, you know, because he's supporting Israel, but they'll refuse, to, but they'll come out and attack anyone like myself, like the Solidarity Movement, uh, because we are um, standing up for, 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 for Palestinian rights. So, as long as the U.S. needs Israel, it will it will defend anything Israel does, right? Uh, and I think it's really important to understand that the strength of the Israeli lobby in the U.S. Yes, it's there, but it is not the fundamental question. Once Israel is no longer useful to the U.S., they will dump it overnight, and then you'll find Republican um, Republican senators claiming, ah, oh, 
it was the Jews that got us into all these wars in the Middle East. You know, it's cost us all this money, cost us all these lives. It's the bloody Jews. They will, they will turn on the Jewish community and, and it, will be, it will be just appalling, as appalling as this filthy right-wing, um, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is. It's, it's a vile stain on, on humanity and, and it's a stain on, on, on Europeans. I mean, it was, it was it's European anti-Semitism which mm. drove the Holocaust. If you looked at the, at the situation in the Middle East, you'd say, crumbs, it must be that the Palestinians caused the Holocaust. I mean, historically, well, that, that's absolutely untrue, of course. It was Europeans that, that drove the Holocaust. And in fact, in, in, um, in Muslim-majority countries, Jews have found um, a safe haven often from European anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Yeah, you, you, ma you make a lot of good points. And I think an important part of that is that, you know, the allegations of anti-Semitism, of course, um, you know, they, they imply that the Jewish people are a monolith uh, and they all share the same, um, you know, partisan views about Israel and are completely pro-Israel when obviously there's, you know, myriad uh, Jewish activists for Palestine. And, and a crucial point that, uh, Noam Chomsky has raised is that, you know, who of course is Jewish as well, uh, is that really, you know, Israel is portrayed as the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, yet, you know, it's essentially a theocracy because people who aren't of Jewish heritage are excluded from full citizenship, as you say. And so, you know, if we look at the other kind of theocracies uh, in the area, you know, Saudi Arabia, which of course is another ally of the US, um, though those just don't even have a semblance of democracy. And so I think it's really kind of a, um, a poor and incredibly flawed argument to make that this is a democratic country, yet it uses what it's founded upon in order to further subjugate uh, the Palestinians and, and further this kind of ideological um, view that, you know, if you're criticizing Israel in any way, you are anti-Semitic. Yeah, I think the... Um the only democracy in the Middle East is one of those myths that, that the pro-Israeli lobby have, have pushed um, around, around the world. Another one is that, um, that, the, that the Israeli Defense Force is the most moral army in the world. These are just plain bloody myths. And I just saw something from the Israeli ambassador to the UK who's called, who said the Nakba, which is the catastrophe for Palestinians in 1948, the Nakba is an Arab lie. You know, these are these are filthy, racist comments. Um, I mean, this whole pro-Israeli lobby is driven by this, what you know, by race hatred of Arabs and race hatred of Palestinians. And you can you can not just sense it, but you can read it in their words, like like the words of the uh, like the words of Netanyahu and like the words of the Israeli ambassador to the to to the UK. Just just come back to Jeremy Corbyn for a minute. Mm, yeah, I sure. What Jeremy Corbyn came up with a a whole raft of progressive policies that were a serious challenge to neoliberalism mm -hmm. so the the, the right-wing press in britain went about trying to find ways they could undermine um uh jeremy corbyn and they tried all these different arguments and the one argument that they were able to get an edge in on was was on anti-semitism so they whipped that into a frenzy and that's why it's um i think they they worked to undermine him. What they did, they they gave enormous coverage to the to what were often incredibly spurious allegations um, relating to people within the Labour Party. When in fact we all know that the, the Conservative Party in Britain is the party of anti-Semitism. It has been all the way back, the blatant anti-Semitism right from uh, for, for the past hundred years. You can you can trace um, 100, 120 years. You can trace that very clearly. So um, so I think it, it was they found a way to attack him because he was promoting progressive policies, not necessarily because, uh, and part of that was policies on, policies on Israel. He was going to uh, ban a weapons um, uh, exports to Israel, for example. So um, it's very important to keep this in perspective that there's a, there's a wider sort of geopolitical sort of um, thing we need, we need to look at here um, when we're looking at this whole question. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you, you make a really good point about the progressive policies of Corbyn, you know, making him a target for um, the right wing press. Of course, the Daily Mail was, was founded by a fascist. Um, and 
you know, because I, I feel like capitalism is, is kind of inherently tied into all of this, and at least neoliberalism is as well, uh, because, you know, you look at Bernie Sanders, for example, Bernie Sanders and Corbyn are probably the two um, leaders who have, you know, threatened the concentration of wealth in any way in, in their respective countries. And Sanders, even though he's Jewish, has, has faced allegations of anti-Semitism. Um, and so, it, you know, as you say, there's really um, rampant right-wing ideological forces at play. And because of the way capitalism is structured, it means they have a monopoly on basically what people think and, and, and the information yeah. people consume. And, yeah. and so what that leads to is, you know, all these kind of bad faith arguments of, uh, about, you know, um, this, that, and third. And, and it, it just kind of muddies the debates we need to be having about justice for oppressed peoples everywhere. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, uh, um, I mean, yeah, muddying the water is, is true. And I think, um, like, like the pro-Israeli lobby used things like, for example, one of their favorite things, and it, and it was used in the case of South Africa. You know, white South Africans would always say, oh, it's very complicated. You can't understand it unless you come here. Um, uh, you shouldn't make a comment about the Middle East unless you know the history of the Middle East. All of these things which are creating an enormous smokescreen. And I, I do meet uh, people quite often who say, oh, look, I'm not really sure what I think about the Middle East. And what they're doing is simply reflecting this, um, this massive smokescreen that's put up and, and being nervous about being seen to be anti-Semitic. Um, and that's the environment that the pro-Israeli lobby in New Zealand has worked very hard to achieve. They want to, to muddy, to stifle, to sideline, to, to um, obfuscate, you know, to confuse the situation as much as possible. And, and they, in fact, don't want Israel in the news. They want Israel-Palestine out of the news. Um, they do not want to see um, this issue debated in New Zealand because they know when the issue comes out of the closet, as it were, they are losing. Every time it's being debated in public, they are losing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of their, um, I mean, one of the, one of the most um, aggressive um, defenders of Israel in New Zealand is um, David Kuman of the Israel Institute. And David Kuman of the Israel Institute is blatantly anti-Palestinian. He's a deeply, deeply racist, anti-Palestinian and, and, and anti-Arab racist. You know, he, he, um, he says, uh, you know, that um, when, you know, he, he quoted um, uh, Golda Meir, a former um, Israeli prime minister, who said that uh, when the Arabs love their children as much as they hate Jews, then, then we'll begin to make progress in the Middle East. That is an appalling, vile statement of anti-Arab racism. And Kuman, Kuman um, you know, parades that. Um, so I think, um, sort of coming back to something I said earlier, I think underneath this is, um, you know, it, it, it's a colonial project that Israel has got mm -hmm. going in, 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 in Palestine. It, it, it was always a colonial project. All the early, um, all the early Zionists talked about it as a colonial project, um, uh, which is where you go into another and that's someone else's land. You push the people off and you build your own community on that land. And they're doing it in an environment where we now have international laws that that speak directly against that. You know, we didn't have that when when Europeans came to New Zealand or Canada or, or, or Australia or the US, but those international laws are there now. And those are the laws that we are, we're telling the government, you need to make the relationship with Israel based on, on Israel accepting international law and accepting United Nations resolutions. And if we do that, then we'll be, our government will be taking steps to pressure Israel to end the occupation, to stop the siege of Gaza, to um, to force Israel to abandon its its apartheid laws against the Palestine against its own Palestinian uh, citizenship. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally agree. Now, I recently read on Palestine um, by two leading critics of Israel, Noam Chomsky and Ilan Pape, um, and a crucial point that Pape makes is that. Um, even the common discourse around this issue is just inherently weighted towards the Israeli cause. Uh, you know, you, you touched on the fact that colonialism is really not a word thrown around that much. It's, it's not viewed uh, by many sides as a colonial project because of the reasons we've touched on before. Um, but, you know, phrases like two-state solution and peace process 
seem to imply that this is an even keeled uh, conflict as opposed to one side colonizing and effectively committing um, genocide over, over, over uh, many decades uh, against yeah. the Palestinian population. Um, you know, do you agree that we need to do away with these terms and promote a, a discourse which goes much further in acknowledging uh, the plight of Palestine at the hands of the Israeli government? Well, I think the final shape of that, um, of, of what happens in the Middle East, is, is for the people there to, to decide for themselves. But for me personally, I think the two-state solution is dead and buried. And it was buried under illegal Israeli settlements on Palestinian land. They have, they have, um, they have effectively prevented the formation of a viable independent Palestinian state. So... It, the focus then shifts to a single secular state where you have a democratic constitution which guarantees equal rights for everybody and it also guarantees religious freedom for Jews, for Christians, for Muslims. And that is the, that is the I think, has to be the end goal for, for, for the area of what is now Israel-Palestine, the area between the Mediterranean Sea and the, and the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. a single secular state where everybody has equal rights. So, I, I mean, I know Elan Pape has been, been pushing that for a long time and, and many others are now seeing that as the only way forward. Um, the Palestinian Authority themselves still talk about a two-state solution and even Hamas has said that they are prepared to go along with a two-state solution. But I think they're holding on to that because that is where the United Nations at, is at at the moment. But I think the people of um, Palestinians and human rights activists around the world are moving towards that situation of saying, like the transition happened in South Africa, it can happen in, in, uh, in, in Palestine. In other words, um, you, you create a democratic constitution, everybody has, has equal rights, which you have in South Africa. The same thing should apply to Palestine. Mm, yeah, I agree. And on, on, on South Africa, obviously, um, you know, since the since the period away, uh, you know, transition away from apartheid, it, it's still kind of a country which is a shambles because essentially, um, you know, a, a small concentration of of the black population have been incorporated into the pre-existing bourgeois establishment, essentially, um, and so obviously, you know, we're we're not geniuses and can't necessarily predict what a, what a future society may look like. Um, but do you think that certain steps need to be taken in order to ensure that it, you know, even if it was a one state solution, it doesn't devolve into um, another massively unequal situation? Yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you've, you've, you've hit, you know, you've hit a incredibly important point because in, in South Africa, you know, um, I mean, I've talked to many, um, many of us, people in South Africa who were activists around the time of the transition. And, and uh, at the time, you know, in the early 1990s, the, the activists were focused very much on the new constitution because white South Africa was trying to get a gerrymandered constitution, which would effectively increase the value of white votes compared to black votes. And so all the activists were focused on that. And meanwhile, behind closed doors, you had the senior leadership of the ANC signing up to neoliberalism. And, uh, and the US only gave the green light, if you like, the US and the UK only gave the green light for this, for this transition to occur once they had the ANC corralled into a neoliberal um, establishment. So, so when the apartheid laws went, discrimination on, on the basis of race just morphed seamlessly into discrimination on the basis of your socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, the only people able to move out of their out of their black townships were people with enough money to buy in a in a in a white area, and even right now, I mean, I'm, I know we're getting a little bit off topic here, but mm. even if you even if you look at the Springboks, Springbok rugby team, um, and there are a lot of you know there are black players there, and all of those black players, every single one of them, came up through being selected or being cherry picked to attend an elite white school. Mm. They were not, they didn't come up through the black townships. And uh, that's an absolute disgrace. I mean, the, the ANC has got, you know, history will be extremely harsh on the ANC um, for, for what it's done in the last 24 years since, since 
black South Africans have had so look, 26 years since South African black South Africans have, have had to vote. I think with with regard to the to the um, to the Middle East, you know, I, I'm actually a lot more hopeful. I think there's a very strong socialist um, um, uh, history among Jewish people around the world in communities all around the world. Very strong, um, uh, you know, socialist tradition. Um, and I know I'm, I'm hope I'm not getting off track here, Barnaby. But there's one little story I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll mention here was um, when the early Zionists, the leading Zionists, were were had the idea of creating this, this Jewish state. Um, they were looking to create it somewhere in the world. They looked at, um, the, the British suggested, oh, try Uganda, you know, move to Uganda or, or Australia or um, South America. They had all these options and they chose in the end, they went with, with the Middle East. But Shane Weisberg, who was one of the, uh, one of the leading Zionists, went to Moscow in 19, in just around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, and was looking to recruit young Jews into the Zionist movement. And he wrote back to um, Theodore Herzl, the, um, you know, the leading, if you like, the father of modern political Zionism, and said, it's, a, it, it's no good here. All the leading young Jews are with the Bolsheviks. Mm. They're part of the revolution. So, so the Jewish communities um, in, in Russia at that time, they saw their future as being um, in a movement of international solidarity, that Jews would be protected not by isolating themselves, but by being part of a, so, a socialist movement. And that, I think, remains the, um, the, the, the greatest um, challenge to racism everywhere. Um, the, way we, uh, the way we fight racism is through community solidarity. When one group is attacked, everyone gets behind them. Um, and, you know, when the when they were spray painting the, the Jewish graves in, in, in Auckland. I mean, Socialist Al Taro organized a public protest. And, mm -hmm. and I went along, a whole lot of people went along and we condemned what was going on. So the community coming together to condemn acts of anti-Semitism is, is really important. And Islamophobia and um, racism against Maori or, P or Pacific Island people, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and obviously we, we've touched on it earlier a little bit, um, but the US is, of course, a crucial part of this puzzle. As I, you know, the peace process is basically dead in the water, um, partially, well, maybe entirely because it's moderated by the US, which has an incredible partisan bias in one direction. Um, and, and as you say, they're the world's dominant geopolitical force. And because of their unwavering support of Israel, their crimes have been able to continue with total impunity. So how do you think we can organize in order to put pressure on the US to, to cease support of Israel? Because obviously it was a, um, a, an important part of apartheid ending was when Reagan finally um, yeah, abandoned support for, for South Africa. Um, and so... I feel like that that could be a crucial a, a crucial part of how rapid change and radical change happens, you know, very quickly. So, how do you think we can organise yep. to do that? Well, I think we we often, um, you know, those of us um, sort of really concerned about Palestine, we often sort of undersell ourselves in the, in that we think that um, that we're facing this this monolith, which is the US, which is uh, which is completely sort of dominant in this issue. And I don't think that's that's the case anymore. The ground is shifting. Yes, you've got Biden and Trump, you know, competing to support Israel. You've got um, the leadership within um, the U.S. competing to see who can support Israel the most. But underneath that, you've got this big groundswell within the U.S. and, in fact, internationally, in support of the Palestinian people. It's moving in that way. And so while there's there's these little elite conversations going on up here the ground is shifting from under them. And it's shifting from under them because of the, the BDS movement, essentially, the mm -hmm. boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It is, um, it, it is a movement of enormous power. And the reason we know it has enormous power is because Israel is obsessed with it. Israel is desperate to break the BDS movement, which is why they're, they're promoting all of these, um, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, to, to conflate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. All of that stuff is going on in, in a fevered way 
within the pro-Israeli lobby because they because they are desperately scared about BDS. Now, in, South, in the case of South Africa, it was international solidarity along with the struggle in South Africa, which 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 overthrew the apartheid system, right? And um, it's worth remembering that you know the last you know, the last votes at the United Nations. Um, it was the UK, the US, and Israel supporting white South Africa. The entire rest of the world supporting the struggle, um, supporting the struggle of black South Africans. And I think we're heading in that direction. And I think things are going to happen, Barnaby, more quickly than we think. You know, mm -hmm. um, we were um, really. I remember the, the late 1980s was a was an appalling time in South Africa. There were assassinations. There were death squads. There were the the regime was 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 thrashing out in all directions because it sensed it was losing. And I think the same thing is beginning to happen in, 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 the, in the Middle East. We're seeing these acts of, of, of incredible brutality, which are in a sense almost acts of desperation. I think we're, um, you know, the darkest time is, uh, comes just before the dawn. And I think we're in that dark time now with, with Palestine, but I think things are gonna change quickly. Mm, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. and. Yeah, yeah, a crucial part of that, as you as you mentioned earlier, is that Israel wants to stay out of the news, because mm. you know it's once the facts are clear and once you're actually getting a, a kind of an objective view um, of of what's happening, it's obvious that Israel are the oppressors and they mm. don't want to become a pariah state. And mm. as you know, as soon as the coverage increases and and there's more mobilization, um, you know, in, in countries elsewhere against israel then their position is just going to become increasingly untenable um and and you mentioned the the bds movement um and it, it certainly picked up steam in recent times um and so you know obviously you see it as a as a worthwhile avenue for us to continue to go down um but what you know what else at this stage can people like us who live on the other side of the world to, to what's happening uh, do in order to affect change? You know, what other steps can, can we take in order to show solidarity and, and, and voice our dissent? Well, there's a, there are a lot of things that, that people can do. Um, one of the most important, I think, would be to join the, the solidarity movement. You know, get, um, just sign up to our newsletter so you can see what's going on. I mean, every month we, or every two weeks, we put out a newsletter and we're always asking our supporters to, to, um, to take some simple actions that, that they can. And, uh, you know, it might be to send a, um, to copy and paste an email to the Prime Minister or to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, there's those kinds of things. There's um, doing your daily shopping, a boycott, anything to do with Israel, anything that starts with a barcode 729, don't buy it. Um, and, and look for the other, other ones as well. Um, and, uh, uh, taking part in the solidarity protest. I mean, we had a, a, our best sort of solidarity action yet, I think was our, our national day of, of solidarity with um, Palestinians, a national day against annexation on the 4th of July. And we had, I think, 10 different centers with, um, with gathering public protests, if you like. Um, and those, we're growing in strength and, uh, and extending our ability to do those in more centers. So yeah, if people get in touch with us, just at, um, if they go to, um, www.psna.nz, just psna.nz. That's the Palestine Solidarity Network, Aotearoa. Um, and that, that's our page. Get on our mailing list, get our newsletter, and see what you can do. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, I just, it, it just, it, you know, as I'm sure it does you, it, it pains, it pains me to think about um, the injustice and the impunity that, it, that it's being carried out with. Of course, the US, you know, there's just countless examples of, of U.S. atrocities, uh, you know, going nowhere. I mean, Henry Kissinger has a Nobel Peace Prize, um, uh, you know, and as does yeah. Obama. Um, yeah. And and so, yeah, I I I'm I'm really encouraged by the movement that that is continuing to grow and people like you, activists um, mm. who are lobbying the government uh, to to put pressure on it because, you know, I obviously um, since since the nuclear free movement, uh, our relations with with the us have have um gone a little bit more a little bit cold but we are still aligned with them internationally and they are yeah. broadly an ally of ours mm -hmm. so i feel as i'm sure you do that um action here in in aotearoa really can have an impact um 
because you know it, it's really an important step into um, ensuring that the U.S. stops its support, you know, with with the greatest possible urgency. Yeah, I think that um, New Zealand, in this, in the case of the Middle East, I think New Zealand is a country that can punch well above its weight, like we did in the case of South Africa. And I say that because we are we are not seen to be with the U.S. and Australia and the UK, which are quite quite extreme in their pro in their sort of pro Israeli policies. Yes, we've got um, you know pro Israeli policies, but we've also got some more room to move, I think. And I think we can, um, what happens here is going to impact in, in those other countries. And I think um, we're in a position where we can get our government to move. And any, any movement that our government makes, I think will, will be seen as very important on the international stage. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. That, that's about all the questions I have. Um, thank you so much for, for talking to me and enlightening hopefully a few people who will watch this. Um, but yeah, unless you've got any final remarks, we can, we can wrap it up there. No, thanks, Barnaby. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you and, uh, I'm sorry I missed the earlier, earlier appointment for the call. Oh, no worries. No worries. Um, I'm always trying to get politicians and whatnot on. So I'm, I'm used to, uh, a bit of, a bit of tardiness, <laughs> but we got to have the talk. So great. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Okay.